we are the the ESG Digital Innovation Hub, an international and multi-partner cooperation that support companies in um, easy accessing the, the digital technologies and, and services offered by the European Open Science Cloud. Um, but we are um, we are a work package uh, of the EOSCAP project uh, that uh, is focusing centralized innovation activities uh, within the, the EOSC. Uh, the main goals of this session are to provide an an update of the of the EOSC DI8 on the on the EOSC innovation landscape and the and the role that the industry plays. Uh, we want also to raise awareness about the EOSC DI8 as the mechanism for industrial engagement. Uh, in addition, we we expect uh, to facilitate the cooperation between the different European Open Science Cloud service providers. Uh, the related projects uh, with the Europe the, with the um, EOSC DI8, and so we will have uh, we, we will be able to enhance the EOSC DI8 uh, technical offer. And finally, uh, we want to increase the visibility of the EOSC DI8 um, business pilots that uh, are running or have run in, in the past uh, during the project. So before starting with the first speaker, um, just a quick reminder that uh, in this session we will use the Zoom chat for the uh, question and answers uh, part, so no Slido. And um, after the presentation of the invited speakers, we will organize a first round of the quality and I call, uh, question and answers. So the first speaker is Sai Holsinger. Uh, Sai is the EOS DIH coordinator and he's the strategy and innovation team lead, team lead and business development manager at the EGI Foundation. He has about 15 years of experience in uh, European projects, uh, managing and supporting the development or, and implementation of infrastructures for research and innovation. SI when you want. Sure. <laughs> so let me share my screen. So so I hope uh, you can you can see my screen now. Everything's okay. Yes. Um, good. So thank you very much, uh, Aliza, for the for the introduction and for everybody uh, joining joining our session. So, um, yeah, the, the first kind of introduction to to the session as a whole. Um, I'll be basically giving you some background to the digital innovation hub landscape and basically the specific activities that we've been doing inside of the digital innovation hub itself, which I think will be, let's say, a nice segue into the, the, the later presentations from the European Commission around the future funding models and then potentially from uh, the executive board trying to understand how we could maybe find, facilitate some information, uh, information exchange to make sure that we're aligned from the governance level and then kind of give some space to the individual pilots to basically tell you what they've been doing. So that's pretty much going to be the outline of my presentation, which is the background to the digital innovation hubs, what we're offering, what we've done to date and where we think we need to go into the future. So just two quick words about basically what digital innovation hubs are, just so we're kind of like all on the, on the same page. So basically public private partnerships have been going on for several years. This is, this is nothing new. However, the digital innovation hub as a concept, as a word, as a term has been a way to more easily, let's say communicate the activities that we're carrying out on a on a day to day basis, which then makes it easier for us to align with different initiatives 
um, whether they're sector specific or in different regions, it makes basically the, the language that we're speaking a little bit more clear. So from the European Commission point of view, they've defined the uh, digital innovation hubs as an ecosystem of startups, SMEs, large industries, together with researchers, accelerators, investors that kind of come together and stimulate innovation. So the Digital Innovation Hub is kind of part of um, the European Commission's digital single market. So it's all about digitizing EU industry. And here you can see that they've specifically mentioned that the European Open Science Cloud is a key component in this strategy, as well as um, wanting to create this kind of pan-European network of digital innovation hubs. So it's like a, a logical conclusion to then combine the two and say, we want to create and support and run and operate and expand a digital innovation hub for the EOSC. So <clears throat> basically what, what they, what they've said is, well, what do the, the services that each of the digital innovation hubs need to provide? So there's this concept that will be repeated uh, over and over, which is about test before you invest. And I think the spirit here is like in these pre-commercial activities in order to kind of stimulate conceptual models, prototypes, go to market, but basically is my idea good, solid, valid, and could scale in, in, in a digital age. But this also comes with the need for specific training and skills, um, connection to investment opportunities. So we really want to create like an entire ecosystem of, of actors in this specific space. So they, the European Commission has basically been putting some, some funding um, in a number of different initiatives. You may or may not have seen, for an example, Fireware, where they're funding different uh, innovation hubs. I4MS is a little bit more focused in, in manufacturing. But overall, they've been basically funding different initiatives in order to stimulate the creation of digital innovation hubs. So over the years, there's been either existing public-private partnerships that are coalescing or calling themselves or um, consider themselves a digital innovation hub. So as a mechanism for trying to track these different, um, these different digital innovation hubs across Europe, uh, the commission has put together a catalog where you can basically register and provide uh, who you are, where you are, what services that you're offering and a sort of registry of these digital innovation hubs. So there has been several working groups over the last couple of years, but now in order to create or coalesce this pan-European network, yeah, you have the catalog, which at least you know who they are, but now you need to start to pull them together. So there's a, a CSA a project, which is called DIHNet, which is charged with basically pulling together and being a part of or creating this digital innovation hub community. So the EOS Digital Innovation Hub, we've happily joined a partnership with them and we participate uh, in their working groups. So that brings us kind of to, that's the landscape of digital innovation hubs. So the question then pulls, well then what's the role of industry in all of this with inside of the EOSC? So we can kind of put them in four main buckets. So we definitely see the industry being a customer. So simply making use of existing EOSC services. They could also be a provider. So they have services that they would then like to offer to the EOSC community. There's also where this kind of partnership where we're co-developing things together. So we're jointly operating, we're jointly co-creating, whether it's a new product, service, um, whatever it is, we're just simply providing them with consultancy and expertise. And then the other one is per, uh, um, participating in the procurement framework. And I think you've heard of ongoing initiatives such as uh, OCRE that's helping to support and trying to make sense of a complex environment within procurement with industry can surely play a role. So moving into a little bit more about the, uh, the EOS Digital Innovation Hub itself. So um, it's all about onboarding industry uh, partnerships. So if you basically want to engage with the EOS, give an industry flavor, it can go through the Digital Innovation Hub. There's a partner network to be able to uh, engage with them. 
also following the spirit of like the EOSC hub project, which is about trying to reduce the fragmentation of, of services across the, the research, uh, research and science and innovation space. The same thing we want to do for our industry engagement program. So each infrastructure had their own industry engagement programs and we're trying to pull those together, which then um, increases, it simplifies the request process and it also basically extends the service portfolio of the individual providers. So in order to kickstart this at the beginning of the EOS Cub project, we had six business pilots that we started with, which helped us get up and running. And then over the course of time, we've been uh, onboarding new ones. So we've onboarded five new pilots since then. We're open to more and I'll go into uh, how we're doing that. And then the idea is, is that basically the digital innovation hub will live beyond the life of any single project. So we're already putting the mechanisms in place so that when the EOS Cub project finishes, the digital innovation hub remains and there'll be multiple um, support initiatives or projects for how it will operate in the future. So really it just kind of boils down to us wanting to offer the access to these kind of infrastructure resources, facilitate the partnerships between all of these different actors. We're now getting a number of different requests for the industrial engagement activities for other uh, EC projects and initiatives, as well as wanting to serve as a kind of a bridge for these other research infrastructures, such as the ESPRI projects into EOSC and industry. Um, many SMEs and startups uh, have limited visibility in their local small markets. So by partnering with a European or international community raises the individual profiles of them provide coaching if they need it for go-to-market strategies. And then obviously after a pilot, there could be some opportunities for providing uh, ongoing uh, services for future opportunities. So we're always looking at longer term business relationships. So we just tried to somehow bucket all of these services into some type of categorization. And we basically broke them down into, well, we offer support for piloting and co-design. Um, we do offer technical access to either compute, storage, data management. Now through some of our partnerships, we're including services like machine learning and artificial intelligence. We have a number of different data providers across the EOS landscape. So if any of the industry would like to take advantage or build applications on top of the research data, we should help facilitate that reuse of our own tools and applications, and then providing them with the, the human services, training, support, and then the visibility, the marketing, the media exposure, participation in events, which you'll hear later, even in this session, we'll have a couple pilots, um, but I'll go into more detail in that session. And then also, for example, if they want to be a provider, maybe the output of one of the pilots is a new service that they would like to make available in the, in the market, we then make that available. So we have our strategy yeah, basically to serve as the mechanism for um, Can we automatically mute people? Yep, that's done. Thank um, so we do our long term strategy is to basically serve as the mechanism for industry engagement with the EOSC and live behind the, the project. So we are already officially registered. We started setting up like our own dedicated promotional material. So our own branding, which we're, we're in the process of doing a refresh. We have our own website, our own social media, such as Twitter, LinkedIn accounts. And then we really focus on having dedicated brochures, videos, articles. We have success story public applications on the pilots that are running in themselves. So really trying to like establish its own outside of any project. So we have a number of partnerships that are already ongoing. Like I said, this is one of our mechanisms for constantly expanding the services that we're offering through the Digital Innovation Hub. And we do that by partnering with other organizations. And one of the examples has been uh, with the Deep Hybrid Cloud. Um, as one example of adding or augmenting our service portfolio with more machine learning type services. But we are working with other networks and digital innovation hubs like uh, BDVA for the Big Data Value Association, as well as some regional partnerships. And then even through the EOS Cub project, we have a number of different providers that have been working for an example in the earth observation space that comes from commercial, uh, you know, commercial entities. So we put together some vouchers. So one of the limitations in EOS Cub was is that we didn't have um, 
a cascade funding mechanism. So we had to come up with mechanisms by which we could at least concrete some or put some type of monetary value on the services that we were offering. So we created kind of a free trial offer. We did a 5K giveaway at the ICT event. Um, there's now a dedicated section for the Digital Innovation Hub on the portal. And we're trying to offer our services in the marketplace and as a recent activity to stimulate new pilots coming into the, uh, into the Digital Innovation Hub, we ran an open call which closed at the beginning of May and we are in the final selection process. So we received 16 applications and we will go up to we will select up to five is basically the amount of resources that we had available in the project to be able to support. So we'll probably have another five pilots being onboarded in addition to the 11 uh, that we already have. So I'm not going to go into a, a detail about this because I'm, uh, Marcin will discuss this um, as his introduction to the business pilots, but we, do have, we did start with six that were in a variety of different sectors. I think the main message to come out of here is that basically each pilot had different mature, they came in with different maturity levels and that's okay. Some of them just had an idea and they wanted to run a prototype. Others had a prototype and they wanted to move to having like early, first early adopters. Other ones already had some early adopters and they wanted to see if it would scale in a final solution. So we, we get them all across the board. Um, we have uh, onboarded five new business pilots. In fact, three of them you will hear from directly, so there's no point in me taking away their thunder, um, but you'll hear three of them later in this uh, session. Others have already presented inside of other um, EOSC-related events, and obviously we're, we're in the process of onboarding both via the open call as well as the partners in the Digital Innovation Hub. So there's a number of different activities. So every business pilot comes with dedicated support um, so that they have dedicated plans, um, constant um, meetings and updates to kind of follow to make sure that their plans are on track and they're gonna hit their key results. And then we try to give them the visibility at our events. There's a couple lists. I may just highlight the one where one of the, our business pilots won the best demo um, at the last uh, EOS Cub Week in, in Prague as well. And then we have our first success story publication that we published uh, towards the end of last year. We'll definitely do a new one towards the end of this year with all of the new business cases that we have, um, that we've onboarded. So where are we going from here? This is my last slide before passing it back over. So yeah, our yeah, our focus right now is basically providing support to our existing pilots and onboarding new ones. Um, we have seen in recent months that there has been, let's say, an increased number of partnerships, whether the ones that we've managed to put onto the website with some others that we have, let's say, some logs on the fire. Um, I think the, the, the launch of the new website was probably one of the key drivers of this because it really helps people kind of understand where they, where they fit. Um, and then really just trying to continue exactly what we're doing through this session, which is expanding the knowledge that we exist and what services that we offer and that we want to continue to expand moving forward. I think we're going to have to definitely um, coordinate more with the EOSC uh, governance to make sure that what we're doing in the Digital Innovation Hub is visible in any future for strategic documents. And right now we're defining this kind of what we're calling the terms of reference, which will be basically the description of how we will operate as, let's say, a multi-provider partnership outside of any given project. So we hope to have the terms of reference finalized over the next couple of months. And then right now we're just doing a final survey of the different thematic services, competence centers, and pilots in terms of what are the next round of commercialization topics that they would like to have specific consultancy with. So here's just the basically final numbers in terms of what we've managed to do. Um, so it's not only just getting the Digital Innovation Hub set up and defined and, and coordinated, but it's been the direct support of the individual SMEs. So we have 11 pilots to date, totaling 16 SMEs supported. 
um, a number of uh, compute hours, uh, success stories, uh, 600K almost in SME support. Uh, we've been uh, attending a number of different industry events. Um, our Twitter followers, our social media presence is slowly ramping up and we've gotten a couple services into the EOSC marketplace as a result. So obviously I'm speaking because I'm the coordinator of the, of the Digital Innovation Hub, but basically all of these activities, the results that we achieved is thanks to a lot of committed people uh, that go into building up the, the Digital Innovation Hub team. So just to kind of acknowledge the, the rest of the individual partners that kind of made all this happen. So with that, I'll stop and I'm happy to take any questions that we may have time for. Okay, thank you very much, Sai. Um, uh, now the turn for Anne-Marie Sassen. Anne-Marie is the Deputy Head of Unit Technologies and, System, and Systems for Digitizing Industry at the DigiConnect in the European Commission. So, yeah. Hello, uh, good afternoon. I hope you hear me well. Um, yes, I also want to explain something about the Digital Innovation Hubs, but uh, Sai has just uh, explained many things already. Uh, nevertheless, the perspective that I will take is a little bit different than uh, Sai's perspective. I think Sai was talking more from the perspective of technology suppliers and, uh, for instance, startups who would have a, a technology offer, whereas uh, I would like to talk more about uh, the user or the, the SMEs that are currently not investing in any digital technology. Uh, Rob, can you please go to the next slide? So we've seen this, this picture already on the slides of uh, Sai. Um, but we, we, he also had a definition about digital innovation hubs. I have a slightly different uh, definition. So what these uh, European digital innovation hubs should do is they should really support uh, SMEs, but also public sector organizations uh, to provide them with technological expertise and experimentation facilities to enable their digital transformation. Because at the moment, uh, if we look at the differences between uh, large companies and small companies in terms of how much uh, they invest in digital technologies, then we see that more than uh, about 60% of the large companies, they are highly digitized, whereas only 20% of the small companies are highly digitized. So this is really uh, a big differences and all the technologies are available to anyone but it's simply too difficult for the SMEs to, to follow all the new technologies, to understand uh, what they could use in their business processes, and uh, therefore uh, a response to that market failure, let's say, is to, to set up digital innovation hubs everywhere in Europe, close to the companies that speak the language of the companies, and that can help, with the, help them to first uh, define a vision of what, which are the, the technologies that, that could help them, and then indeed to test them out before they need to invest it. So the core service is indeed this test before invest. For instance, uh, if a company would like to use a certain robot, uh, they could try it out for a couple of weeks in their in their own production process to see how it really is to work with this robot. What are the skills that the people need? Uh, do we need to reprogram it every day? I mean, there are many, if you want to use these robots, there are many more things than just acquiring uh, the robot that needs to be done. And then the company can experience that. They can develop a return on investment analysis and that way decide whether they really want, to, you know, whether this robot really brings uh, advantages to them. Um, indeed, what Sai also said is that the ecosystem building is, is very important. And while there is this testing, for instance, with the robot, as I said, 
we also would like very much that the digital innovation hub involves the the startups or the supply industry who could deliver such products to this user industry the typical participants that we see in the in the digital innovation hubs are research and technology organizations so rtos and uh, technical universities who would have facilities who would have uh, technical knowledge but they should work in collaboration with industry associations clusters um, in order to reach out to the to the sme uh, to the users of, of this hub and to also understand very well uh, the needs of, of the users uh, they should also collaborate with enterprise europe network which are quite often uh, which is also a european network uh, built up of chamber of commerce who are also very much in contact with with smes uh, they should team up with uh, local accelerators and incubators where usually uh, the startups are somewhere uh, groups with innovation agencies and then also with vocational training institutes that could deliver uh, training services to the to the companies that would need to work with these new digital technologies so the four services test before invest support to find investments and building this ecosystem and skills and training should be brought as a kind of one-stop shop to the companies and the public sector organizations we want to build uh, a network of digital innovation hubs and actually in digital europe program which i will explain later we want to invest in around well let's say between 160 and until 240 European digital innovation hubs that are geographical spread everywhere in Europe. Um, of course, you are, for instance, uh, the EOC digital innovation hub is more a virtual hub, if I understood it well. I think you are offering your services through the internet, and of course, that's very fine and, and that's good. But here we are looking really for um, physical physical i would you call it places where uh, you can receive uh, companies and where where you can meet them because we are targeting the very difficult to reach companies who are at the moment not at all investing in digital technologies and therefore um, we think that such a physical nearness is is an advantage to be able to understand them better and engage them more uh, can you please go to the next slide? So this slide uh, explains the different uh, funding opportunities for digital innovation hubs in the next multi-annual financial framework. So that will start 2021 and will run until 2027. And uh, the first opportunity will be Horizon Europe, where we want to continue with initiatives that have, we have been uh, doing so far. For instance, in I4MS, which was uh, briefly mentioned by uh, Sai. Um, so here, we really want to fund SMEs that experiment with highly innovative digital technologies by making use of a, of a digital innovation hub. But the, the grant should mostly benefit the SMEs. We will have a new program, which I will explain in more detail from now on, and it's called Digital Europe Program. And Digital Europe Program, that is meant to invest in digital capacities. So it will be similar program as Horizon Europe, but not focusing on research and innovation, but focusing on um, investing in the digital capacities in, in supercomputers in uh, large data sets in cyber security in the things that we need to support uh, the european economy with their digital transformation and as part of digital europe we want to uh, fund or invest more in digital innovation hubs and that grant will serve to uh, support the facilities and personnel of the European digital innovation hubs to build capacity in Europe to diffuse digital innovations across SMEs and administrations. So we will not be funding the SMEs, but we will really be funding 
the digital innovation hubs themselves so that they can be uh, stronger, they can hire more personnel and they can invest in more uh, facilities. And then there are uh, other programs, for instance, Invest EU, that will be um, uh, financial instruments mostly for uh, banks to bank guarantees for, for banks so that they have less risks when they grant loans to SMEs, for instance, but also for um, investors who, who want to invest in startups and scale ups. And uh, the last uh, fund that I want to mention here is the European Regional Development Fund. So this is a, a fund which is uh, allocated at national level. So it are the member states who, who will uh, decide how they will spend these funds, but also these funds can be used to invest to invest in uh, in digital innovation hubs and in fact in digital europe we are expecting co-investments of the member states and the european commission in the same hubs both 50 percent and uh, the european Re regional development fund erdf can be used by member states for this co-financing can you please go to the next slide Yeah, this slide uh, gives an overview of uh, how we see the overall structure of Digital Europe program. So I already explained, we are going to invest in digital capacities. And these digital capacities, they will be in the area of high performance computing, uh, artificial intelligence, cybersecurity and trust. Advanced digital skills, these are digital skills in the areas of uh, HPC, AI and cybersecurity. And then we have uh, a fifth strategic objective, which is called uh, deployment and best use of digital capacity and interoperability. And there we want to stim stimulate uh, projects of, of importance to, to really um, show how all these capacities can be used in a, in a best way. Uh, so we are building all these uh, capacities. For instance, in HPC, there will be the acquisition of uh, very high performance uh, computers. Uh, in artificial intelligence, there will be investments in uh, data spaces um, and also in uh, testing and experimentation facilities, which are really high end, for instance, hospitals of the future where uh, researchers working on, on arti artificial intelligence or companies developing products for um, artificial intelligence projects can go to test out their, their innov innovations. And we will also be investing in an uh, AI on demand platform, which makes available algorithms that, that anybody can use to uh, adopt AI in their uh, company. Cybersecurity and trust, it will, for instance, uh, invest in uh, an audit uh, program, which companies can use to, um, to get uh, quality recognition that their products are cyber secure, for instance. So we have these uh, projects that develop digital capacities and then it will be the role of the of the between 160 and 240 digital innovation hubs that we will be funding also in digital year program to uh, diffuse these digital capacities to their stakeholders so to their region and uh, the, for instance, if I take an easy example, it's the AI on demand platform. Um, all the digital innovation hubs that are part of this program, they will be trained to learn how to use the AI on demand platform. And that will then ensure that every digital innovation hub can work with its own SMEs or with its own public sector organizations. To, and then the ones who could really benefit from this AI on demand platform can then through the digital innovation app learn how, how to use it and uh, and then really that would really mean that all these capacities will be widely used everywhere in all regions of Europe. So that's one important task of the European digital innovation hubs 
and it's also really an advantage of every hub that is funded in this program that they will get uh, access to the facilities that are built up in the different strategic objectives and that they also will be uh, trained how to make use of them. That's one knowledge flow that we will have. Then on the other hand, every European Digital Innovation Hubs themselves, they will also have uh, their own specialization. And this specialization, it should be linked to the needs of the industry in their region. So if it's an agriculture region, the specialization could be on uh, precision farming, for instance, if, if you want to go to something digital. If it's more a manufacturing uh, region, the specialization could be on industry 4.0. Uh, if it's a logistics re region, uh, they could do um, AI for logistics or things like that. But every, every region will have its own, every European digital innovation will have its own specialization, which must be relevant for the uh, local economy and help them with both the digital, but also, for instance, the su sustainability transition that they need to make. Um, that will also mean that uh, every European, not uh, all the SMEs in one region could possibly be helped by the local digital innovation hub. Sometimes they would simply need other expertise than what is available locally. So then the advantage of that all these hubs are networked is that the, the local company could find their expertise, could find support from another European digital innovation hub that is part of the network. The hubs will also um, exchange best practices and learn from each other and successful setups that are, are carried that are uh, already um, being carried out in certain regions could be uh, copied into other regions so they will really learn from each other and that way we will get effective transfer of expertise between different regions so um, so this picture is, is very important to understand how, what will be the role of the European Digital Innovation Hubs in Digital Europe program. Of course, every hub, they will get their individual grant and this grant then they can use to invest in facilities and people. And every hub should be 50% co-funded by the EU and 50% by the member states or the regions. Um, and the whole network will be supported by one special node, which we call the Digital Transformation Accelerator, which you could see as a, um, a support activity that then animates the network. So they will organize uh, networking events between the different hubs. They will be organizing the train the trainer events that need to take place. They will organize best practice sharing. They will develop an interactive map of all the digital capacities that uh, are available. And here I also added something with you because I see you somewhere in between a digital capacity or a European digital innovation hub. And uh, they could also uh, organize collaborations with you, where you uh, explain your offer to the other European digital innovation hubs and that, that the, the other hubs are kind of um, um, scale up mechanism for you to reach out to all kinds of SMEs to which at the moment you are not uh, able to reach out by yourself. Uh, could you please go to the next slide? And Marie, um, three minutes, please. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I already explained a little bit that this networking that will really provide uh, the European uh, added value. So we will get uh, an export and import of excellence of the European Digital Innovation Hubs and everybody can really focus on specializing and doesn't need to invest in all kinds of, of infrastructure but we will have in the network complementary competences and infrastructures. And then of course there is really the um, advantage of that every hub can learn from all the specialists in HPC, cybersecurity, AI, uh, and that more mature digital innovation hub can help less mature ones 
so that all the differences that we see in regions between uptake of digital technology hopefully will be uh, smoothened. Can you please go to the to the next slide? Yeah, I just this is the last thing that I want to explain to you. Since we are investing together with the member states in the European Digital Innovation Hub, there's also a very innovative um, two-step selection process. And the first step is that the member states they will be proposing candidate entities for the European Digital Innovation Hub. They have, select the, they have to select those entities through an open and competitive process. And then they have to uh, give to the Commission a list of all the entities that they want to support in their country. The Commission takes this list. We then have to do a formal uh, decision, which we it's called a Commission decision. And that will be... Uh, normally uh, a list where all the entities from all the member states are put together. These entities, uh, they will then be invited to a restricted call for proposals. And, um, and then it goes to a process that you know more of Horizon 2020 also. Uh, all those entities then have to uh, write a proposal submitted to us before a deadline that will be evaluated with external experts and then we will rank all these proposals balancing uh, of course the quality which is reflected by the score uh, but also geographical technological and sectoral coverage so that we will get really a diverse network of european digital innovation hubs and, and Marie, uh, we need to yeah. uh, keep on okay. with the next. So uh, please good. analyze on. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So this is that uh, process. And then my next slide. Uh, Rob, can you go to the next slide? Yes. So I just want to tell you that uh, we expect to have the designated hubs uh, possibly by October 2020. We will have an event which will be fully digital where the designated digital innovation hubs can uh, network. It will be in November 2020 and then we expect the restricted call to take place in quarter four. And then my next slide are just some uh, links with uh, more information where you can read it all in detail. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne-Marie. Um, well, now uh, it's the turn for uh, Jean-François Abramatic. Uh, he is an emeritus senior scientist at Enria and serves on the EOSC executive board as uh, the um, architecture uh, working group chair um, and um, individual expert. So, uh, not speaking formally on behalf of the U.S. Executive Board, um, he's, he has been kind enough to join us to give his personal thoughts and opinions with uh, how he sees the role of industry uh, and the European Open Science Cloud. So, please. Thank you very much, Elisa. Um, and uh, thanks for giving me the, the opportunity to, to share a few ideas. Uh, I am, uh, as Elisa told, uh, told you, I am a senior uh, emeritus senior scientist at INRIA. My career was uh, split between research and industry, so I have had a chance over my career to be engaged in, uh, in research activity as well as uh, managing uh, startup companies or, or working in large ones since I ended my career at IBM. Uh, during the whole course of my career, I was also uh, chairman of the World Wide Web Consortium. So I have experience in a multi-stakeholder uh, initiative. In this case, it was to build the web. And uh, I'm uh, happy to be able to contribute uh, to the development of EOSC, which is a different uh, multi-stakeholder initiatives. But uh, it's, uh, it's certainly uh, you know, very, very needed and promising uh, for, for all of us. So if we can go to the next slide. Hello. Um, it's here in the European Open Science Cloud Objective 3. And it's currently okay. showing. 
I can't see it, so I don't know. Um, uh, uh, Elise, are you able to see uh, um, the Oscar Jackets tree slide? Uh, this is the presentation, but we we don't see in in the presentation uh, mode. Ah, just a second. Let me try once more. Okay. How about now? Yeah, that's much better. Okay. Thank you so much, Rob. Thank you so much. So. Uh, you probably know that uh, EOSC is in a transition. It has been uh, conceived in 2015, launched in 2018. In 2018, it's in the transition 2019-2020 before getting to a sustainable state uh, at the beginning of the Horizon Europe program uh, in the next uh, January. So we are at the moment, the executive board is building uh, the document that will be, uh, that will be the, called the SRIA, uh, Strategic Research and Innovation Agenda, which will summarize everything uh, at the beginning of the stable, sustainable phase, which will be most likely run by a, a dedicated uh, association. So in the course of this work, uh, we have uh, developed this uh, uh, objective tree, which, uh, as you can see, uh, has three, di three dimensions or three routes one related to people and uh, you know, improving the deployment of open science uh, across Europe in order to improve uh, trust, quality, and productivity in science. Uh, the program, of course, is centered on data because that's while uh, the, the overall goal is to be able to share publication, data, software, all research artifacts uh, between scientists uh, the data are, are the, 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 is the domain where there is more work uh, to be done because that are very heterogeneous. There is, they are very volumic. Uh, the, the granularity of it uh, has to be defined and so forth. And uh, so the, the, the whole community is trying to develop what's been called the, the fair principles, uh, apply the fair principles, make data findable and accessible, interoperable and reusable. And, uh, and if, and that's the, the, the point I would like to insist in this first slide, uh, if and when uh, data are available that way, uh, it will have an impact on industry in general. Of course, it will have an impact on science since scientists will be able to share uh, those data, but anybody will be able to share those data and that would provide opportunities for development of innovative services and products based on this corpus uh, of, uh, of information made available uh, by the fact that uh, data would have become fair. Of course, it's one thing to have uh, data um, following those principles. It's another to be able to access them. And for that, you need infrastructure, uh, which at the moment are reasonably siloed or independent of each other. So the other dimension of the EOS program is to federate those infrastructure so that a single user, whatever he is, uh, he or she is, whether it's an individual scientist or it's an SME or it's a, uh, um, it's, it's a NGO or citizens or public administration, whatever, will be able to access through this federation of infrastructures uh, the, the data that they need to develop their activities. And in particular, for the science perspective, if those uh, infrastructure are connected to each other, it will improve uh, the impact of research in addressing societal challenges, because in many cases, well, the recent, of course, uh, pandemic is a obvious example. In, in many uh, very, challenge, so, uh, very challenging uh, situation for society, uh, the use of multiple sources of information is essential. And, but similarly, in more uh, uh, peaceful or uh, uh, moments or for, for a company, being able for an SME or industry to being able to access multiple uh, sources of information is very often important in order to develop new products and services. So as you can see, uh, you know, industry is one of the three uh, 
uh, ultimate uh, goal of the EOSC uh, between science and society. So the three dimensions, science, industry, and society are part of the overall objective uh, of EOSC. Now, to be more concrete, let's move to the next slide. Uh, so EOSC will be a partnership. So uh, uh, Horizon Europe has been introduced by Anne-Marie a, a moment ago. In this new program, uh, partnerships are a little bit revisited compared to what they were in Horizon 20. Uh, 20. And this slide presents, I think, 47 of those partnerships which are on the way. The caller uh, uh, mentioned various ways, I mean, the, the, uh, of uh, putting together those partnerships. Uh, ways meaning uh, the influence of member states will be very important in the orange one and less important in the blue one. It's not the point today, but what's important is to see that those partnerships address all sorts, uh, energy, transport and mobility, urban environment, health, food and agriculture, manufacturing. So if we go to the next slide, there is one, uh, there are two, sorry, uh, partnerships which are cross uh, domain. It's the one related to innovative SMEs and it's the European Open Science Cloud. So the impact of, uh, of the European Science Cloud will be across all of the partnership. Any of the other partnership in any other domain can leverage uh, the, the, the delivery and the ecosystem of the Europe uh, uh, that EOSC will put together since it will allow any scientist, any user, any citizen, any company uh, to be able to access uh, information that are relevant to their own activities, right? So uh, EOSC in that sense is, uh, is uh, fully enabling all, the, all of those efforts. So if we go to the next slide. And uh, so now, so that's those those are the the previous slide with the good news and the goal for the seven years program and so forth now uh, of course you don't make uh, such a dream uh, come true overnight right and so there will be stages going from where we are today to the moment where uh, you know what I described, uh, that is, anybody will be able to access any sort of information in any sort of domain will, uh, will uh, occur. So uh, we will start with uh, what we call the minimum viable EOSC, which has a core uh, uh, federated data, uh, which, uh, which will allow uh, various disciplines to uh, put forward their, their uh, data, their publication, their software, and share them. Uh, it will be uh, at the beginning focused on public, uh, you know, dedicated to to uh, scientists and uh, and focused on openly uh, uh, open available data. Does it mean that nothing will be done for more complicated tasks when there are uh, private privacy issues or society or security issues? Of course not. But we will start. Uh, you know, at, in terms of the the development can can be uh, engaged on any front, on all fronts, but the deployment, we have to be reasonable in terms of expectation, will start with the minimum viable EOS. Uh, and it will be the role, uh, in this case, more, uh, so, so far I've more mentioned what uh, Sai uh, described as the customer uh, position of uh, an SME, uh, you know, getting access to information uh, available on EOSC. Now, it will be uh, the provider side, I mean, the, the fact that uh, uh, companies, industry, organization of all sorts will be able to join forces and bring uh, their uh, data, their information uh, in, uh, in the EOSC uh, ecosystem uh, while they are using uh, data coming from others. And here, the most important thing, and I would like to close here since uh, I'm running after time, next slide, will be uh, for the provider to co comply with what uh, is under design today. It's called the EOSC interoperability framework for people to benefit whoever they are in particular industry to benefit from uh, uh, the EOSC ecosystem. They will have to follow. It's a, again, it's, it's not a law. It's not a regulation. It's, it's a, a fact of, uh, 
the interoperability has to be built on consensus. In other words, any player uh, in this world has to say, okay, I want to exchange data at the technical level, I will pay attention to those elements, those APIs, those schema that I will use or that I will expose for people to use my, my information. Or I will represent uh, information at the semantic level uh, this way so that it's, it can be understood by partners uh, across, across Europe. Uh, so that's my, the message I wanted to carry. Uh, this is in the works, uh, the 1.0 version of the document of the EOSC interoperability framework was published two days ago, right? So we're at the beginning of the journey, but uh, it's very important for whoever wants to engage in this journey to follow, uh, to follow the, the, the cooperative effort to put together uh, those uh, interoperability capabilities so that they can engage into the ecosystem at the level that fits their own goal. So I will close on that and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Jan Francois. Um, so while, now we are going to open a short um, uh, period for, for uh, questions. So if you have any question, uh, please you can uh, write on the chat or uh, you can uh, um, raise your hand uh, in the in the chat to to if you prefer to speak so i don't see any <coughs> nobody unmuting or changing or raising their hand or putting in the chat. So I will say, oh no, there is one now, Isabel. Um, Hi. Um, yeah, I can also speak. I, yeah, go for yeah. it. <laughs> Hi, I put the video. Uh, I, uh, I have seen the last slide today. I saw it the other day. I, I think I'm not the only one that is puzzled with that slide, after the emails that have been exchanged, etc. And then, uh, so the question that keeps being repeated in many sessions is why is not the EOS hub architecture uh, being considered and the whole thing appears restricted to a question of metadata and PIDs? And, and to be more clear, in the current, uh, if you look at the EOS portal, everything that appears there to the 99% are services related to data processing and analysis, and there are no data, right? Or very few data. So what, what makes you believe that the approach uh, based on metadata, PIDs and all that has any possibilities to, to progress as an EOS, as, as to create anything sustainable? Hello? Uh, I guess the question is for me, right? Um, some, some, someone from industry could also could also explain their view on, on what, uh, on what okay. well let me uh, uh, I apologize uh, I have uh, I am limited in time and my bandwidth is difficult so uh, if I may so first of all EOS Cub is participating in the, uh, the they are representative of EOS Cub in the uh, EOS interoperability framework development uh, they have co-signed uh, they have co-signed the, uh, the initial, uh, the one dot, version 1.0 that I mentioned. So the EOS Club is totally present in, in the activities. In the architecture working group, uh, they, they are probably more representative from EOS Club than from any other, uh, from any other uh, project. I have paid attention that the EOS architecture working group has representative from any uh, any H2020 project and EOS Club is very well represented. So I don't see where, I understand your-, your No, no, your they, might be, they might be represented, but it doesn't mean that they agree. This is the problem with these groups, no? Because from, from the day one, uh, apparently PIDs was the, was the, main, the main concern. And, and I understand it's a concern, but this is at the very end, at the very end of the process. You can ask any, any people from a company here, how easy it is to produce data that uh, do not serve any purpose. Yeah? 
And it is only at the very end of the research or, on the, or of the testing phase, et cetera, that you think uh, of which data are usable and I can keep and I want to preserve, and then I can allocate them some, some permanent identifiers for data preservation purposes. But what, what happens between there and the beginning of the testing phase in, in an industrial process is the 99% of it. Yeah? And what is being presented, not only here, but in general in this session, is uh, to me, it looks like uh, building the house from the rooftop. Well, that's your opinion, it's not mine. What is the, what is the, the solution that uh, this architecture will present to someone coming from, from an SME that wants to deploy a, a, certain, a certain service? What, what, what will you tell them yeah, to do? Okay, so the whole purpose of EOSC is to share this data. So the data that you have produced on your disk drive and which is for your own purpose is not part of EOSC, it's, it's Necessary, we all, as you said, many of the data we produce every day are for ourselves. But then the, the, the whole purpose of EOSC is to share. Open, EOSC means European Open Science Cloud. Okay, open science means uh, the, the information that you exchange between scientists. So it can be publication, data, software, workflows, all of that. So a, a very tiny subset of the data that are produced every day uh, are, um, are supposed to be shared. But those are the ones that are of interest because other scientists, other users, including SMEs, will be interested in those mature data that have been produced by whatever process the producer of data has put together. So the, the, the whole purpose of EOSC is sharing. So, uh, it is, you cannot share if the data are not named, are not located, if you can't discover them, if you can't access to them. Again, the whole purpose of EOSC is to share. So you, the, the you, cannot, you cannot share if you cannot produce data to begin with. So uh, I'm talking of the very it's beginning the role, of the process. It's not the role of EOSC to produce data. I mean, a large hadron collider does not need EOSC to produce uh, high energy physics data. Uh, by, so all the data are produced uh, by other uh, things that EOSC, EOSC is putting together, is allowing to exchange those data which are produced by others, by existing infrastructure, e existing large and small equipment. So large equipment historically, and more and more uh, small equipments thanks to the internet of things. So more and more data are produced. And the whole idea of EOSC is to be able to share those data. No, this is a very restricted vision. This is not in the white papers that we have from EOSC. And this is not the vision of EOSC that has been uh, put forward by the Commission. Yeah? There, is an, there is a comprehensive view that includes from the users to the resource providers, to the policy makers, etc. And, uh, and everyone has a place there. It's not only about allocating permanent identifiers. This is the, the, the end of the road, if you want. Yeah? But OK, since we don't agree on this, I, yes. I would like to know what uh, what people from uh, from the industry uh, from the industry users think about that. Yeah, I think actually we might hear a little bit about the usage of the of research data, and that can be coupled together with maybe some machine learning techniques um, from one of our pilots that will be um, presenting here in the next in the next few minutes. So, uh, so I think this was very interesting discussion, and we should make a note of this to to push forward, but. Um, I think we should close here and see if there's one last question or if we should then move on to the individual uh, business pilots. Um, yeah, I think there are observation on chat also on this subject. Yeah. Because it seems it's, uh, it's got uh, quite of interest. Definitely. Okay, I think we we should move on now to the rest of the uh, of the speakers. And now at the end of the session, we can uh, restart if you want this uh, uh, this conversation. Yeah. So, so just um, before um, Jean Francois leaves, because uh, I know you were restricted on time, I just wanted to say thanks for thanks for joining because I think the message is is good and clear, and I think it's kind of our first opportunity to start to bring the uh, to bridge 
the different activities um, with what's already happening with industry engagement and what could potentially be like kind of fed in to the strategic EOSC level documentation and stuff. So uh, thanks for joining. I think this was kind of a really important first step in that direction. So um, thanks for the time and thanks for the opportunity to, to, sh to share where we are. Thank you. Yeah, thanks to you. Thank you. Oh, well, now time for Martin Plusenik, uh, that is the EOSD IH Pilots Coordinator. He leads the IoT System Department at PSNC and represents Poland in the EOS Architecture Working Group. He has worked in a significant number of projects focused mainly on distributed computing, cloud scientific workflows, sensor networks, remote instrumentation, or Internet of Things. So, please, Martin. Okay, thank you. Uh, and I hope you can see my screen. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yep. So basically, uh, I will very shortly uh, introduce um, our activities, uh, one of the major activities that was also mentioned by Sai before, that is related to business uh, pilot support. So, so uh, our um, uh, co-design and piloting uh, support uh, is uh, um, related uh, uh, for each pilot. Uh, we follow similar implementation plan. So uh, we have designed the plans, uh, designed the, uh, the, the, the solution, uh, the integration. Uh, we help uh, and support the architecture and uh, all the details with technical integration of EOSC. Uh, we go through the KPIs. Uh, uh, there's definition and also um, uh, their monitoring uh, through the, uh, at the later stage, the dissemination, commercialization, and marketing activities and support and exploitation. So depending on the, the pilots, because we have uh, different kinds of pilots in a different maturity state, uh, we can skip some of these phases. Uh, but um, in general, for most of the pilots, <clears throat> we are proceeding with these phases. So, uh, basically how we work, uh, we have community uh, meetings uh, every three weeks uh, uh, and besides that uh, many one-to-one -one meetings with the pilots that are technical, that are related to, to, <clears throat> uh, to, to the commercialization, to the um, e exploitation. Uh, so uh, basically we help and analyze uh, the business pilots from different perspectives. And this really depends on each pilot's needs and on also on their uh, maturity. Uh, in terms of the project itself, we are also kind of an, um, a bridge between other work packages. Uh, and uh, uh, we help uh, 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 with uh, communicating in important aspects related to the events, related uh, to the dissemination materials, uh, trainings and uh, usage of the infrastructure. So um, basically, okay, um, uh, we also uh, uh, help and support uh, uh, the pilots uh, with uh, their dissemination and we also give, an, uh, give them a chance uh, for showing the results. So uh, already uh, on the important uh, EOS events, uh, most of the pilots has been presented in the past. So starting from Lisbon, then in EOS week in Prague, we have uh, another um, uh, four pilots where one uh, uh, got the best uh, demo prize. And then uh, in these uh, sessions, we have um, also uh, in this EOS week, we have also three that presents uh, lightning talks, uh, posters, uh, uh, and uh, demos. Basically, initially we had uh, six pilots. Uh, and uh, so each of the six, as I said, were on different TRL levels. So we help, uh, so with our support, they, uh, they increased the TRL level and um, uh, they used uh, our resources, uh, services, and combine uh, their uh, new added value uh, services. So basically what happened in the meantime, one of the company was acquired by a large industry, another moved from SME to large enterprise. So this is really dy dynamic uh, landscape. So um, after the initial phase, because those six pilots were included initially in the, um, in the EOS Hub project, uh, we onboarded uh, uh, next uh, five uh, pilots and uh, 
where uh, three of those will be in a moment uh, presented and uh, their results and, uh, and how they uh, interact with uh, uh, DIH. And uh, also um, uh, some of them are presenting the posters and, uh, and also presents uh, the demonstrations. What is worth also to mention, uh, one of the pilot here is an example with, of collaboration of the EOS Visual Innovation Hub with uh, another initiative. So in this case of uh, Deep Hybrid Data Cloud Project, where uh, together uh, uh, we supported this pilot together, where uh, the Deep is a provider of some of the services, EOS DIH is a provider of the resources and also uh, support and some of the services, and we combine this effort uh, together. So this is, this is uh, the way of the activities we are performing. Okay. So uh, this was a very short introduction and I think we are, we'll are we move now to lightning talks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. Now we're going to enter to the first, um, with the first pilot that is net service and uh, with uh, Michel Marchesi, that is professor Hello. of software engineering at the University of Cagliari. He has been working on blockchain technology since 2014 and is author of more than 40 papers on the subject. He is founder of uh, Floslav uh, Spinoff, now in the Net Service Group, which works on blockchain solutions. So, please. Hello. Uh, good afternoon to all. I, I think I will uh, try to share my, my desktop if I find the... Uh, just a moment. Uh, oh. Sorry, but I don't find the presentation. Is here? Mm, not yet. <laughs> so, uh, I have the presentation, but uh, I don't uh, share. Oh, I don't. Uh, I'm not able to find it in the present. Just a moment, uh, I think I will. Okay, I will share my desktop. Uh, do you see my the presentation? Uh, we can see your desktop. Only the desktop? Yeah. Sorry, I will uh, close all the windows. Sorry, yeah. but uh, I don't find the, the, the window of, uh, of my presentation in the windows that the Zoom is presenting to me, basically. It is a, uh, okay. Okay, in any case, I, I start to talk about the project. Uh, meanwhile, okay. I, I, I'll try to find uh, the, the, the presentation. Um, the, um, if you prefer, I can uh, yes. present it for, for you. Let me just download it from this. Uh, from ah, if you side. have uh, the, the, the presentation, yes, please. Yes. Just a second. In any case, the project is about uh, a, 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 well, the implementation on uh, the EOS G, uh, servers of a blockchain aimed to, okay, now we see, for uh, to um, certify university certificates. Sorry for the, uh, the double word. Um, the idea, please go on on the next, uh, next slide. Um, it is, uh, well, just, just me. <laughs> I am a professor of social engineering, but you already presented me. Please uh, go next. Okay. The idea is uh, to, it, what, what has been done is a pilot project um, 
with the aim to address the possibility to issue valid official document in a, G, in a digital form using a blockchain. And the proposed architecture is based on a permission of the blockchain, which is now Ethereum proof of authority. Permission, is, so it is running on a private blockchain um, made in, in practice in, uh, in nodes uh, um, provided by EOS. And uh, uh, it uh, periodically um, anchor, anchors itself to a public blockchain to get uh, immutability. Um, the blockchain can be obtained that there is, uh, it is ready, it is running. There is uh, an API service, so uh, an external client can uh, um, use the blockchain using this uh, public interface. And um, the pilot is uh, aimed to, to um, provide the services to certify uh, university diplomas, uh, like the diploma supplement, which is a standard for a degree certificate uh, of Europe, from European uh, universities. You can go next, please. Okay, uh, the idea is that uh, you know that the paper certificates can be easily forged. Uh, today, there are very powerful way to forge uh, a paper document. And so uh, they can, uh, start from a, a, a true certificate, changing the data inside it, or uh, totally forged. So the idea is that if you, uh, clearly also if you deliver a certificate using uh, a PDF, so in digital form, again, this can be easily forged if it is a simple PDF. It is uh, digitally signed, uh, well, it is more difficult to, to, to forge it, but uh, uh, again, uh, um, um, it, it could be difficult to verify the authenticity of a document in any case, uh, especially outside the European Union. So the idea is to uh, certify these documents uh, on a blockchain. So the, uh, the, idea, the idea is that the uh, uh, educational institution um, giving uh, uh, certificates of degree, for instance, um, uh, will uh, um, produce these certificates in a digital form, could be a PDF, and then uh, digitally sign the PDF and write uh, the signature on the blockchain. So it is becomes immutable. It's impossible to forge this, uh, this signature. And uh, the blockchain can be easily uh, um, browsed, inspected uh, from everywhere on the earth with uh, open source tools or with an app uh, that we, we provide. And so uh, even in Australia, or in any, any part of the world, it's very easy following uh, a few step document to, to verify that the, uh, the document is, has not been forged and that the address of the institution which uh, published the, the digital signature is actually the university or the other uh, learning institution that uh, gave the, the diploma, the, the certificate. So it's very easy to, um, to verify the, the fact that the, the uh, certificate is authentic. Can you go next? Uh, the, okay, uh, the, we are working uh, in, uh, we are uh, um, above phase three because we integrated the blockchain solution, solution in uh, EOS C Hub servers. We deployed it using the cloud services. So we use uh, the blockchain runs uh, in, um, I, I think, uh, four, five uh, uh, nodes, uh, all uh, hosted by EOSG and, and different in different uh, places. And uh, uh, there is this, we have the demonstrator because we already are providing uh, an API, a, an interface to use this system to certify documents and in particular uh, certificates for universities. And uh, so the, 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 the service is uh, already uh, uh, working, but clearly uh, what is uh, needed now is uh, uh, clearly to publicize it and to, and to um, uh, write uh, um, apps able to ease the interaction with the system. You can, uh, and this can be done by us, but also by any, any third party firm. Uh, yes, next please. Uh, this is the last one. So the, the impact of a business, uh, well, it's written here, 
clearly uh, it could be a fi an interesting service to the universities and other uh, institutions, teaching institutions of uh, the European Union, and not only. And uh, there is a visibility at international business development level and uh, it's possible to interact with the research centers and to every center that uh, have a need that uh, gives uh, diplomas or certifications and has the need that to, to, to make them uh, unforgeable uh, very easily at a, at a, at a low cost. And now we are uh, uh, working on the business case for it. Thank you for, my, for your attention. Thank you very much, Michel. <laughs> now time to move to the next pilot. Uh, that is uh, Gregor Sniemik from Be Insight. Uh, Gregor is a solution architect at uh, Be Insight and um, an architect, artificial intelligence uh, enthusiast. So please, uh, Gregor, when you want. Yeah, hello, good afternoon. Uh, my goal in this presentation is to introduce the company BI Insight, this is the company that I work for, and also talk a little bit more about one of our products, Enterprise Content Management, because this is the, our case for EOSC BIH pilot. Uh, BI Insight is a company based in Warsaw, Poland. Uh, we have been uh, providing services and products to our customers for more than 14 years now. Uh, some of our customers are top five in Warsaw Stock Exchange, so quite big entities. Um, we have a team of scientists and, and, and engineers, and we specialize in artificial intelligence, data science, business intelligence, data governance, and we are open for new initiatives as part of EOSC uh, platform. Uh, last year, we took part in two competitions uh, part of GovTech program and one uh, of them we won and in the next one we were the second and I will talk a little bit more about this in the next slides. So this is the, the case where we won the competition and it was the challenge was to build a system for a Polish Ministry of Development. This is an organization that is collecting a lot of documents, uh, reports, analysis uh, from all kinds of sources and they are synthesizing the data and they are uh, producing new reports, new presentation for internal, internal use and also they share it uh, with the market. So they had an issue with uh, growing volumes of unstructured data that was scattered across uh, network folders and uh, personal computers. It was locked in uh, data silos and it was hidden from, uh, from people in the organization. So the idea was to create <clears throat> an information hub uh, where the data from uh, uh, internal and external sources is uh, integrated into a central repository where the knowledge is extracted automatically from, uh, from the files and it can flow easily across the organization borders and uh, it's easily accessible by uh, every member of the organization. So we built uh, our solution, BI Enterprise Content Management System. So uh, uh, the system can connect to many popular data store types and it can search for new files, which are then sourced into a processing pipeline uh, where uh, the, the knowledge is extracted automatically from the most common uh, file formats and is stored in a uh, the document uh, database repository and in a search uh, index. Uh, so the system extracts automatically uh, metadata, uh, keywords, named entities. Uh, it can generate uh, document summaries. It can classify documents into taxonomies. It can find similar documents or duplicates of the documents. And based, of, uh, based uh, on user activity, it can recommend new interesting content to, to the user of the system. But apart from building internal repository, uh, the system integrates with uh, external APIs. And uh, uh, for example, we are um, federating queries to open air API. And this is one of the partners in, in the EOSC uh, platform. 
So, and we believe that if an organization is using its data as an asset by, uh, and they use uh, proper tools to explore and exploit the data, they can save time, cost, and they can increase their revenues. And we have demonstrated our system in three use cases. The first one that was described in the business scenario in the previous slides. Uh, this is a system for Ministry of Development and the system is in production uh, now. And they call it internally actual knowledge management system. So uh, the second one is a POC for Polish Parliament, uh, where we um, uh, extract automatically keywords and named entities from the acts of parliament and uh, they want to replace a tedious manual process that they have now so we are talking about the solution and uh, validating its use in this case and the third case is uh, again a poc for national revenue administration and this organization is searching dark uh, dark net for uh, web pages with uh, signs of illegal activities like uh, illegal sales of drugs or uh, alcohol. And we have built a web scraper and um, web spider that are crawling the web, uh, searching for, for the pages that might be interesting for, for the users. And they are sourcing these uh, snapshots of these pages and uh, the data that can be extracted automatically. And this is sourced to the system and then uh, the, the users can use all the functionalities of the system to, to find interesting and relevant, uh, relevant data. So we are still improving the product and in the nearest future, we want to add new uh, features like text analytics, document semantic similarity or relationships uh, network, advanced image processing, for example, a search uh, with picture. And we hope that visibility in EOS marketplace will uh, help us engage with new customers and uh, engage with uh, new initiatives in the community. We want to um, uh, make use of the existing resources and components and services in the, in the platform. And we want to share the same from our side. We want to share the knowledge. We want to share our experience and the components of, of our system. And I believe that's it. Thank you for your attention. And let me know if you have any questions regarding the company or the product. Thank you very much, Gregors. Uh, we will keep the, the questions for the, for the last part of the session. Finally, our last pilot is uh, going to be presented by Daniel Desjardins. Daniel was formerly a professor of physics at the Royal Military College of Canada. He is now the Chief Executive Officer of King's Distributed Systems, the Canadian organization responsible for developing the distributed compute protocol. So, please, Daniel. Thank you very much. Uh, bonjour à tous and, and good morning from Canada. It's 11.30 here. It was an early start. Um, okay, I have control sharing my screen and uh, we'll make this short and sweet. All right. Present. First of all, uh, thank you for the introduction, Eliza, and um, um, we are very grateful to be part of EOSC Hub and the DIH uh, initiative, and it's allowing us to, to test our technology, and not just in Canada, but uh, in Europe. Um, and uh, as we build this, um, this protocol called the Distributed Compute Protocol, or DCP for uh, short, um, we're very excited about its applications in science um, and research. As a background myself, I, I come at this as a physicist. And so um, even for my own purposes, um, having access to more computing resources uh, is always a plus. So without further ado, um, essentially we've built um, a distributed computing framework and a bank. Um, and essentially in this bank, we're metering the consumption of CPU seconds, GPU seconds, bytes in, bytes out, RAM, memory, reputation, and can essentially wire in anything else. And the uh, benefit of this, this framework is that it is completely hardware and environment agnostic. Um, in a demo that we'll do at the end here, we'll be able to source instantly computing power from smartphones, computers, laptops, tablets, 
and even enterprise servers to do a computational physics problem. And we will reward every participant in their bank accounts with credits that are earned. This is important because um, in issues of, of cross-border resource provisioning, let's say you have multiple data centers and, and even entire desktop fleets, how we're able to keep track of who's supplying what and who's consuming what is a problem that's completely distinct from just being able to orchestrate and deploy workloads in the first place. So this, this, uh, this tool is a means of achieving both ends. Um, with EOS C Hub right now, phase one of our pilot that we're grateful to be uh, conducting, we've set up um, the DCP worker agent within uh, two uh, EGI sites, one in Italy and one in France. We've also simultaneously been conducting this in Toronto, Ottawa and Waterloo, which are Canadian uh, sites that are part of the CENGEN, Centers of Excellence for Next Generation Networks, um, digital infrastructure for computing. And what these workers did was they reached out to a scheduler, they pulled down computational uh, tasks that had to do with um, astrophysics and disease modeling. They executed those tasks, sent the results back to the researchers, and then um, credited the accounts of the different workers for the amount of work that they did automatically. Um, and in a phase two, what we're, what we're interested in taking this is uh, uh, bringing in or, or augmenting those, those compute networks uh, with desktop fleets that are otherwise idle at university sites. Um, this could uh, conceivably build some sort of like an EOS, uh, EOSC edge computing network uh, that could be built with idling desktops from universities across all of Europe. Uh, we're doing this right now in Canada. In fact, uh, uh, this just uh, this is about to be announced within the two the next two weeks. But we've won a uh, a large contract to deploy this network across Canadian institutions, educational institutions, in order to run COVID nineteen um, um, forecasting models uh, for uh, municipalities in order to make better decisions about uh, how to reopen. But at the heart of it, it's a computing platform with a, an accounting system that can track uh, resources that are being provided by suppliers and consumed by, um, by individuals or institutions. And very quickly, um, I invite you all uh, to open in a browser tab on any device that you have, whether it's a phone or a laptop or whatever it is, whatever it is you're using, whether it's Mac, Windows, I don't even know and I don't even care. If you open dcp.mn in the browser tab and hit start, you will instantaneously join a small computing network and I'm gonna launch a physics job right now. I'll do it here as an example. I open this site, I hit start, my laptop is now part of a computing cluster. That's it, no download, no install, and it's as secure as online banking. And then when I wanna launch a job, I have a pre-prepared uh, physics job, and this is my own research uh, from Royal Military College. Uh, it has to do with electromagnetic propulsion. The math is horrible, uh, but what's cool about this paper is that any reader can modify the inputs to this scientific paper and recompute right in the paper itself, right in the web page, new results. And a lot of numerical integration here takes, uh, normally takes a lot of time, but by distributing it over multiple workers, for example, uh, I'm receiving tasks here. Uh, multiple workers, multiple devices, all accept tasks, crunch the numbers, and send the results back to my main page here, which is the green bar moving right now. So uh, for embarrassingly parallel tasks, uh, the more devices connect, the faster this goes, because we can distribute them. Uh, and I have the results here. And so I think of this in, in a couple of different ways. A, it's, uh, it opens exciting possibilities for the future of scientific literacy where now you can have interactive scientific papers where people can come and participate and go beyond what the author was exploring. But it also means we can source compute power from any device, no download, no install at the drop of a button, but it also means we can account for how much compute power was provided by who and to who and when. And finally, um, here's a, a really cool example of where this can go. This is a, a presentation or, or a, a similar example that we've done from US Department of Energy Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory. In this example, we can actually distribute the computations for the, uh, the interactions that occur within uh, fusion plasmas inside of uh, their reactors. And so on that, thank you very much. Um, and we look forward to phase two of the pilot, uh, which uh, involves uh, deploying it in more sites uh, 
uh, in conjunction with EOSC Hub and DIH. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Um, well, now time for the um, for the questions. So uh, let's see in the chat if there is anything um, for any of the speakers. There's at least one from Mark Dietrich. I actually don't know Dan. Do you know, I'm guessing you know you know him both basically being in in Canada, I imagine. But of uh, course, <laughs> yeah. I'm guessing this is a cheeky comment, but go ahead. I'll let you answer. But, well, it's interesting. So uh, Jupiter requires, uh, obviously, there, there, you know, some specialized stuff. Um, we're trying to take it to the browser, which makes it completely agnostic to any specialized software or specialized programming languages or, or what have you. Um, we're not going to compete with Jupyter Notebooks or Jupyter Hub or all these groups. We're going to work with them. Um, we think that there are some complementary tools here that, that will benefit everyone. Um, even you know, another example, um, Mathematica, uh, they have their, their, their specialized sort of uh, viewer to create these sort of interactive pages. But again, you need their software and so on and so forth. But their new uh, engine actually outputs uh, WebAssembly objects, which can be trivially exported and distributed on our networks as well. So we're not looking to compete. We differentiate in the way that we can collaborate and integrate with pretty much anything and everything. Um, so in, it's interesting that we bring up Boink, same thing here. So we're not looking to compete with Boink. We're actually looking to bridge certain gaps and work together. So we took the, the project Asteroids at Home, for those who are, of you who are familiar, um, we ported it over to our network and um, we're sort of, we're highlighting a lot of similarities and, and advantages um, that uh, the uh, Joseph, or Joseph Durek out of Charles University, the um, owner of the, the Asteroids at Home project, um, appreciates. So we're looking to work with Boeing to sort of offload um, some of their work and spread it on our networks um, to, to free up more capacity for them to do even more of their research as well. So the idea is all of the, can, all the computers that are idle at universities across all of Europe can create an edge computing network that can augment uh, EOSC's existing centralized uh, core infrastructure uh, for um, grid style computing tasks. Uh, OSG is uh, open source grid. Um, I'm assuming- open, It's open science grid. It's open science grid, okay. Yeah, it's basically the federation of compute centers in the US, basically. It's kind of like Compute Canada, but in the US. Got it. Um, so you, you saw what I just did from a technological perspective that was all in browser and browser compatible. Everyone in Europe will participate in this pilot with a single click. I mean, talk about frictionless um, scalability and adoption. Uh, all these groups, including Boink or whatnot, you have to download and install uh, specific agent. Um, so it's our being completely built on web technology, which takes a distributed computing into the 21st century. Um, no other competitor out, out there is built uh, on top of the, the web stack like this. Maybe there are also questions to other pilots because it's a uh, question and answers uh, yeah. apart, but to all the pilots or previous speakers. So if there are any questions from the floor. Uh, also to, to others. No, um, I have a question for Anne Marie Sassan. Um, you have explained uh, some of the funding opportunities uh, for the um, for the digital innovation hubs, but what are the funding opportunities for those um, uh, for those uh, digital innovation hub like the EOS digital innovation hub that will operate uh, at European level and um, establishing uh, bridges and relations between different DIHs. Uh, thank you, Elisa, for your questions. Uh, I was also thinking about that when I prepared my presentation for you. And um, I would think it would become part of uh, Horizon Europe, 
and then part of the um, area we saw the slide where there were all the uh, partnerships mentioned and there was one on uh, the European Open Science Cloud. So I think like now uh, probably it will be part of, of that part of Horizon Europe. But I am not involved in there in writing the work program, so uh, I am not sure if that's the case. But that is that would be uh, the logical place to to have your work. And otherwise, I also see opportunities, for instance, in a digital Europe program, then, but then not as a digital innovation hub, but more as a data space, for instance. But I, I do think probably your place will be more in Horizon Europe. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, I think there was also a question uh, to Gregos. Uh, if uh, you were uh, also used your tool with the EC documents, Gregos, can you respond on that? Not yet, but we would be more than happy to do it. Uh, we tried uh, our system with uh, the, the, the documents provided by the organization that I mentioned in the use cases. Uh, so, for example, uh, the, the Polish Parliament case, this is the Acts of Parliament uh, in Poland, but uh, we also start talking about uh, using the same kind of documents from European Union, uh, our legs. We also tried our system with uh, ARCSIF uh, documents and with Polish uh, patents, um, but uh, EC documents. Yes, we should do it in the demo that we are uh, deploying as part of the pilot to, to, to the portal. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So are, are there any other questions? Okay, I think that is time to finish. We are uh, 15 uh, minutes late, so uh, I think we can close the session here. Uh, thank you very much, uh, all of you, for your participation. You will find all the uh, slides in the, in the agenda in the Year's Cup um, Week uh, webpage. Um, thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Discussion doesn't have to stop here. Send Bye. us an email if you guys are interested. So, thanks everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye.